baby. And she's just six months old. She's starting to eat her vegetables. And I want to pose to the panel, what do you recommend that Elizabeth should eat or do to live to 120? That seems like an easy enough question. Since I'm a nutritionist, I have no answer. So I pose it to my colleague to start the aging discussion. Okay. Did you want to use the panel? Well, we that. Um, somehow we grabbed the wrong PowerPoint, so I don't have their names up there anymore. So do I want to introduce the panel? I've lost their names. So you know them all. Irfan Rahman, Vittorio Calabrese, Daryl Rimba, Thomas Krola, and we invited Claudio Franceschi because he knows people who are 120, I believe. And so he can best answer this question. Okay, did you have the three topics? So we were going to sort of uh, uh, frame the uh, discussion with three major points. Uh, first, we were going to open the floor for uh, questions and discussion about what are the relative contributions of genetics and environment to uh, aging and age-related pathology? Uh, what are the mechanisms of aging and uh, are there common mechanisms that we can identify that might be able to help us uh, actually intervene to try to extend lifespan and extend health span? And so those are the uh, general topics. Those are pretty broad. Uh, but to get started, the, the focus of this session was to be on nutrition and self-signaling and aging. So to start with, let's uh, open up the discussion for, uh, there are many known, not many, there are a handful really of signaling pathways that have been shown to in, uh, be involved in regulating longevity. I think the IGF uh, insulin signaling pathway is certainly a conserved one. The uh, targeted rapamycin pathway is another and there are known very common elements that are involved in aging, oxidative stress, uh, inflammation, etc. So I'd like to open up to the panel. Uh, the first line of questioning is, how much of the uh, lifespan is actually determined by genetics and these pathways, and how much is determined by uh, environment and diet, such as diet and exercise? May I start? Um, well, first of all, genetics, the genes do not work in the void. So genetics in the environment interplay. So this is very important because uh, everything that we observe in humans or in animal models should be uh, qualified regarding the environment in which the animal model live. And, uh, the uh, type uh, of uh, environment and nutrition that the lifestyle, and it was also a lifestyle, uh, had. So the question is good, but probably we have to, to, to try to disentangle two uh, components which uh, interact each other. What I would like to suggest from our experience is that uh, the uh, candidate genes approach that uh, we pursue it, and also the GWAS, the genome-wide studies that we did, suggest that there are different uh, <coughs> uh, genetics related to longevity in different populations. So you cannot generalize what you find in uh, Dutch or Finnish to the, to the one what you find in, uh, in, uh, in Bologna or in Greece. And uh, this is uh, very important because when you publish a paper, usually the reviewer asks you to repeat uh, the, uh, the, the data in another population. And if the data do not uh, uh, um, uh, repeat the previous experiment, they say that there is something wrong, that the paper is unacceptable. This is uh, very stupid because uh, uh, the human beings are different in different countries, they have different backgrounds, this is particularly true, for example, for the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, so uh, the request to have the same results 
in different population is something that, of course, if, if, it, if it occurs, is good, but if, if it is not, there is nothing wrong. And uh, there can be a geographic specific effect. And you heard about the APOE, that there is this enormous gradient in Finland, is 22%, uh, and in Bologna it's uh, 6%, so four times. And this is a tremendous uh, little, uh, the APOE4, uh, and has a tremendous power as a risk factor for many diseases. There are others, uh, um, um, gradients, for example, IL-6 is the same in Europe, uh, and so on. So you have to take into account that the human population is uh, uh, derived from, uh, from, from Africa, has a long history, and changed uh, enormously. Um, just so, if I could interrupt sorry, you a sorry. second. Sorry. Um, I, I'm struck. If different human, or if humans are different between Italy and Finland, um, I think some of the people down at this end of the table were looking at yeast, or at mice, or at rats, or worms. Um, maybe, should I believe them? Um, I guess I can talk a little bit about the, the issue with mice. Uh, so, first, back, back to the, your original question as to uh, what to do to live to 120. So, I think that um, you know, people who are centenarians or super centenarians, they probably have a very um, special set of genes that allow, allows them to reach that age. So, uh, unfortunately, I think uh, for that question, my answer would be, unless she was born with the right set of genes, it doesn't matter what she would eat. She would uh, reach that age. Uh, that's based on our... And there's a nice parallel to our mouse work, which is that the, the lifespan of different mouse strains is different. Um, and for most of them, caloric restriction has a positive impact, but not for all. So, you know, based on what we know right now, um, the science would suggest that the best approach would be to have a mildly restricted caloric intake that, you know, that's been tested in, in monkeys so it's the further we are as far as testing intervention for aging <coughs> in, in primates and it seems to work in monkeys as well but again because um, the studies in caloric restriction in mice suggest that there's different effects in different strains you know, it, it probably would benefit most humans, but not all. So there's that um, issue uh, of the genetic variation in the interaction of the environment. So are there any other comments from the participants here, please? Uh, I, I think the problem with caloric restriction is that it's basically not feasible in Western societies. I mean, uh, we know from, from rodent studies that caloric restriction is increasing lifespan, but this works in a, in a mouse. But I think it's not, we cannot convert this into, uh, into humans. It will, I think it will be not feasible. Also, we are recommending five portions of fruits and veg in, uh, in Europe. But I mean, if we reach two, we are lucky, at least in my country. So I, I think it, it will be very difficult to, to, to translate data from, from, from rodents and, uh, into dietary recommendations in, in humans. I, I agree that it's probably not, uh, not feasible in humans. So, I think there are, in general, two ways that we think about intervening. You know, one is, uh, for example, we saw uh, a talk on doing mimicry of caloric restriction. Can we find, can we, can we model the caloric restriction response? Based on that, can we target genes, pathways, uh, regimens that will recapitulate that without actually going through the, the caloric restriction uh, uh, regimen. And second, I think for model organisms, what we definitely have learned is that there are conserved pathways in that longevity. The question is, can we target, knowing that, can we target those specifically to, to intervene with age-related pathology and disease? So I, I would uh, ask you to comment on, on which of those two strategies is best and uh, we have an opinion on that. And also, people from the audience are welcome so to we comment as well. Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, I just come back to the original question about <laughs> Elizabeth. 
how you like to make her to live to 120 years. I think apart from the you know few people who have been shown to be uh, genetic responses for um, the disease progression or the susceptibility. These are very few population, few individuals who are related to genetic alteration. I personally think that this is not an important thing with respect to the aging and with respect to the disease. I, because genetic is genetic element is fixed. What we need to see to find a dynamic process, which I feel is epigenomics. I'm not saying epigenetics. I'm saying epigenomics, because epigenetic could potentially be the DNA methylation, but epigenomics can be several things which can interact with DNA, with proteins in the genome. So. What we eat, what we have the uh, lifestyle with the environment, with the diet, with the sun, with the poverty, with the hungerness, with the satiety, I think epigenomics plays important role in terms of defining a population or an individual to make him or her susceptible for that particular disease. So I just would like to mention, apart from genetics, there is element epigenomics, and that's potentially important, and redox signaling plays an important role in regulating epigenomics. So, Vittorio, would you like to comment? Yes, I would like also to uh, emphasize that it's possible to differentiate the concept of longevity with, uh, uh, to some extent, the quality of life that not necessarily uh, means longevity because we want to uh, live longer but also we want also the, the quality of life is better independent of longevity but also it's important that uh, we cannot say nothing if we don't measure and uh, uh, in China they say we cannot catch a black cat in a dark room especially if the dark, in the dark room the black cat doesn't exist we have we have <laughs> Caloric restriction. We have an exercise that definitely have an impact, and we can start from this to see what kind of approach, what kind of modulation we can uh, uh, develop, refine to control this mechanism to get the benefits of uh, uh, an increasing knowledge on this uh, perspective. So please. So I would uh, like to add a further uh, consideration, and that is a major difference in those of us sitting in the room, and that is gender. Uh, and that one size gender does not fit all. Uh, and that uh, I suspect that 90% of the science that's presented at this meeting and other meetings is based on one gender. Uh, and. So I think it would part when we think about the, the interventions with caloric restriction or other kinds of interventions uh, that we've made large-scale assumptions that intervention X will work on all genders, uh, whether they're an XX gender or an XY. Uh, so I think we can add to the to-do list um, beginning to look at gender differences both in our basic science at preclinical and clinical uh, investigations. So following up on that again, your, your question was about, <coughs> about your granddaughter. And so clearly you've done half of the work, correct? The other, the other half of the answer is that I think it's clearly, a, as you were saying, well, it's clearly a mixture of, the, of genetics, genomics, and, and environment. And uh, in in that regard, lost my picture. Oh, never mind. In that regard, uh, the in that regard, the, the longest lived person, as far as we know, was Jean Calmont, who lived to be 122 in terms of being carefully recorded, and she lived right here. Yeah. So the best thing you can do is to bring a granddaughter <laughs> over to Paris, and she'll live on. Uh, I'm bringing my granddaughter to Alba, so if you'd like to meet her in person, 
please. Uh, were there any other comments from the audience, I believe? Um, one of the <clears throat> things that my friends in my mind when we talk about longevity is that the greatest deterrents to living long are the diseases of aging. That's short of not getting run over by a bus. Okay? And this is cancer, atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. Those are probably the, the, the big killers. And a, a large percentage of our potential centenarians are gone as a result of these diseases before we even have a chance to fulfill our genetic potential. So I think it's very important one of those of these, and particularly your lifestyle. Okay, take your cigarettes away from her. And don't go into in the first place. Now that's just, I mean, that's, that, that's just, that's just, that's just too obvious, but, but I think there, there has to be also, I think, consideration in any program of, of, of living longer to give consideration to these, to these specific pathological conditions that kill us before we have a chance to get old. Particularly cancer, cardiovascular disease. I think these are all, these are all preventable diseases and, and preventable deterrents to, to aging. Just, just a little bit of aside there, and uh, maybe, maybe I'm begging the main question, but uh, that, that, that's uh, what I think is very important to consider. Well, I think can I, can we're I, almost ready to go. Can I, can I make a, one comment? Okay. It's clear from the study of the genetic of uh, very old people, so genetics, on that uh, they have in their genome uh, the risk alleles. So the people uh, reach a hundred or more despite having, uh, as uh, most of us, uh, uh, risk alleles for major diseases. So this is not the lack of uh, risk alleles which make us uh, uh, more prone to reach the uh, hand. So that's why I turn to the next slide, which has what are the mechanisms of aging? And this has a few things that I learned about, oxidative stress, inflammation, hormesis, timing or age of the exposures. Is there something about your environment that makes your genes do something differently? And maybe, Vittorio, you would like to start with this Vitagenes concept. Are there ways we can turn on genes that make us healthier? Yes. We have a target that we can uh, um, approach to, to test this possibility. Uh, Vitagenes are a group of genes that respond to nutritional intervention, to lifestyle, and uh, uh, perhaps are impacted by caloric restriction. We have had uh, enough information regarding the role of uh, uh, central metabolic tone on the effect of longevity. When we activate, uh, when we proceed with caloric restriction, we have uh, an effect on uh, glucagon insulin ratio. We know that the tenfold decrease in the uh, insulin glucagon ratio which means increase in glucagon, decrease in insulin, corresponds to more than uh, three times decrease, threefold decrease in ROS production. And uh, uh, this is a very, a very a consistent, consistent result that we can modulate with uh, uh, smart drugs in the next future, having in mind that gene of the cellular stress response of, uh, um, involved in the regulation of cell survival can have a major role in all polygenic system acting in determining the aging process. So I'm confused. I'm a nutritionist. I understand simple things like nutrition. I ask these nice gentlemen, okay, Tell me what genes are going to make me live longer, which are the ones that for sure, in all the different systems, um, it looks like this is what's important, and all that I've come away with, besides APOE, is maybe GLUT4. Um, 
is, did I get it right, or is it wrong, or uh, what, what, what makes an animal live longer? Eat shock protein, for instance. They, uh, if we uh, induce, uh, analyze uh, caloric resistant animals, or if we analyze the effect of uh, mass of exercise, in both cases we have eat shock protein induction, modulation. What we have with aging, we have, you have a decrease in the capability of uh, obtaining a robust heat shock response, which we want to modulate just to minimize the effect of aging, for instance. Do the rest of you agree? Well, um, um, again, um, it's quite specific. Maybe there are multifactorial uh, possibilities and multifactorial genes which are related to aging um, and anti-aging. So one of those aspects which we thought about the uh, regulation of the DNA damage. Um, because when we have a replicative senescence, uh, cells are able to cope quite well actually. They are able to survive, but under a condition when a situation arrives uh, that the cell is arrested, then, then especially under a stress condition, then the the DNA repair, uh, I think is very important play a role uh, in terms of aging and survival and especially non-homologous end joining that kind of repair. So that's an important part of the uh, leaving the cell longer. Uh, our cells in mammalian, they multiply faster and especially that is related to oxygen consumption. Because oxygen consumption is very low in mouse and in elephants, it's even higher. And the rate of oxygen consumption is directly related to longevity and also related to body weight. So maybe vital genes are related to elephants different than the mouse. So one thing that I came away with from listening to all the talks and posters at this meeting is that there could be, I'm going to pose this as a possibility, a common mechanism involved here. And it seems to me that if you look at TOR signaling, you look at the insulin growth factor signaling pathway, you look at a lot of the pathology that's related with age-related uh, diseases, the common denominator almost always seems to come down to oxidative stress and, and damage and stress responses in some way, shape, or form. And so if that's really true, that is really a... a joining point to where we should all start to think about interventions to, uh, I think to Moss, maybe you could speak to this in particular, showing the caloric restriction is impacting mitochondrial ROS, which is impacting genomic instability, and uh, maybe there is a commonality, maybe there is a common thing that we can sort of uh, culminate around in terms of intervention. I, th I think one problem um, in the aging field that's starting to be addressed is the fact that when people think about aging, uh, you, you ask the question, what can you do to retard aging? People most often think immediately about something that might impact lifespan. But lifespan is actually just one of the phenotypes of aging. So, um, you know, if you look at aging at a tissue-specific basis, you have, for example, age-related hearing loss, cardiac dysfunction, um, many loss of adult stem cells. So, um, the fact that an intervention doesn't extend lifespan doesn't mean that it doesn't have a that it could not have a significant impact on, on aging. For example, we've shown that the lipoic acid and coenzyme Q10 can retard um, age-related hearing loss in the mouse, and it's quite effective. But when we feed the same doses, uh, I believe, um, to mice and look at their lifespan, there's really no effect. So. If you just look at lifespan, you might think, well, these nutrients really don't do anything as far as aging. But if you start looking at specific systems, you see that they can have an impact. So that's something unresolved in the field of aging right now. Why is it a di different outcome from life lifespan and age-related um, physiological decline or functional decline? Um, well, in search of... Um 
an integrated picture and commonalities between species and models. I think that this idea of the adaptation of the body to uh, damages. So, uh, suppose that uh, damages for one reason or another are occurring at every level. DNA, RNA, proteins, cell, membrane and so on. If the body uh, reacts, so probably everything is, the key factor is uh, which mechanisms are uh, involved in this reaction to damages. So the rate of damages first, which is probably uh, genetically controlled because each species has a definite lifespan and whatever type of uh, caloric restriction you will never uh, at least uh, apparently reach uh, in a mouse a hundred years uh, because uh, the entire machinery is fixed. But the key point is that whatever animal uh, react to damages and uh, start uh, a response to damages. I don't know if the response to stress is the right uh, word. And uh, include, in, in, uh, I think that uh, what we heard in this meeting is uh, extremely interesting because uh, suggests that this is the, 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 the key point to intervene. And then would suggest that the inflammation is another point, which is another commonality uh, and, and that of, of, of oxidative stress and inflammation are a, a, a response. A response to do better, to, to, to cope with the, the damages, to neutralize the damages. Of course, this response can be, uh, can go over and become very deleterious. Not only neutralize the damage, but also uh, be itself a, a, a a damage, and this is probably the case of the inflammation, which is a key uh, physiological uh, response, but can turn detrimental if, if it is probably too much for genetic reason, for nutritional lifestyle, and so on. Sure, please. I, I just would like to comment one more time on uh, caloric restriction. I mean, uh, many people go on, a, especially women, go on a calorie restricted diet for, for some time, but then they have a period of time of free feeding and, and then we always observe the so-called catch-up fat phenomenon, so they, they overshoot and, and, and the body composition changes to the, to, to, to the worse. And therefore I, I think it's, it's not feasible in, in, in practice, since we, we have so many examples where people try to lose weight. But then you have this yo-yo effect. They, they lose weight in the, in the short term, but they regain weight, and especially they regain fat. And uh, the BMI increases, but what's the body composition that changes? So I, I think the learning restriction is, is a very good model to, 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 to understand uh, also aging uh, in, in, a, in, in role models or in, in, in worms or in, in Drosophila. But, as a nutritionist, I, I, I would not recommend uh, caloric restriction since it, it will never be a lifelong caloric restriction. Then you have uh, more adverse than uh, uh, beneficial effects in the long run. I just wanted to give a comment to, to that. First of all, the biggest effect in caloric restriction in animals is like if you start rest after the meeting, after stopping the lactation period. So no one in humans will do it with this child right after year one to put in a caloric restriction. And then whatever, as far as I understand caloric restriction in animal models, you supply them with sufficient amount of micronutrients and minerals, which we don't achieve in the normal human population as we learn today. So even if we are not in a caloric restriction, we have some for uh, my Hidden hunger, which might be, um, well, preventing this might have a much bigger effect than any caloric impact. But if you are not um, obese, let's say. So, but in a normal population, to uh, fight the micronutrient deficiencies might have a major impact on, on some of these uh, outcomes. I think this is a very interesting connection because you have mentioned the yo-yo effect 
and the uh, caloric restriction, how they are connected. Simply because uh, caloric restriction uh, uh, upregulate, uh, downregulate insulin. When you have uh, uh, people under a uh, diet, why they come back to uh, weight gain, maybe more than before, because their insulin is high. We now know, when you use uh, intervention like uh, nutritional uh, parenteral, uh, enteroparental nutrition, neck, you put a, a balloon and give protein, you reproduce the same condition that you have with caloric restriction, where uh, a nefa and branched chain amino acids are the major uh, fuel, which means much less loss production <coughs> over long term effect, in a long term effect. This is very important because we might control the effect of diet without uh, 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 have the uh, drawbacks of gain weight and the uh, major problems coming from this perturbation. Another aspect is acetylation. We know that with caloric restriction induce uh, uh, reduce ROS production and increase acetylation of uh, metabolic enzymes. And uh, this is uh, another way how central metabolism reflects the control of the glucagon insulin ratio. Insulin means pro-inflammation. So, it seems that we might have a general picture that work on a broad range of uh, uh, possibility, and uh, we need to, to pay more attention on this uh, uh, complexity to gain uh, major feedback in a positive way. One uh, of the mechanisms shown there, and what I've heard, we, we, we have not paid you attention to telomerase and telomere length. I think that uh, the telomerase, we've shown it, is involved in aging, provided that you protect against cancer. There are many possibilities of uh, interacting with telomerase as um, and work by the very Elizabeth Blackwood is covered in this show that the race is inherited by this perceived psychological stress. So psychological and this is she published in in PNAS in the in very recently plus one and offers her. So uh, uh, probably the number race has to be considered a mechanism of intrinsic aging and perceived psychological stress can be a mechanism of regulating it. That's a, a really excellent point, and I, I wanted to add to that. Uh, many of you probably saw the recent paper by Ronnie Pino's lab of reactivating telomerase and extending one span, which is a very compelling uh, study. But I want to point out that in that paper, they also found major metabolic disruptions as a result of telomerase efficiency. <coughs> Uh, mitochondrial issues as well. Telomerase protein has been shown to localize to mitochondria. Its function there is not known or not understood. So I, I, I keep coming back to this idea that there is a commonality to all of these pathways, telomerase, genomic instability, insulin pathways, TOR signal. I mean, come on, there's a mitochondrial theory of aging that's been around for a long time, and it just seems to me that all roads seem to come back to it at some level. And if that's really true, and that that's driving oxidative stress, reactive oxygen signaling uh, disruptions, and uh, it, mitochondria is a, is a hub of innate immune system regulation, it's really amazing that area has just broken free recently. It's involved in inflammasome uh, activation, it's involved in TLR signaling, etc. So I just wonder if, you know, the writing is on the wall here. I'm a little bit biased in this opinion, of course. But even the telomerase story, I, 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 I agree. I always say telomerase is sort of this outlier uh, theory, but maybe that's all the same. And so uh, I'd like to put that out to everybody as well. Yeah, so in connection with telomerase, and then the, one of the questions here, timing or age of exposures. Um, actually, as we know, the most of the research we see in publications is on fibroblasts with respect to the senescence 
and nothing has been almost done in vivo in living in creatures, living animals. So there's some aspect we should be considering how this senescence aging can be monitored in mammalian system. So with respect to uh, aging exposure, uh, I'd like to emphasize two points here. One thing is the time of exposure, and the second thing about the role of inflammation in regulating the, um, the disease outcome or the progression of the disease. In our model, when we put mouse, mice in exposure chamber for, for example, in tobacco smoke here, at a particular age, which is age 40 of mammalian age, our human age, they are able to compensate, they are able to recover age 40 plus 45 plus minus 5. They are able to recover and they have adaptive response. But after that, four months of exposure, when we continue to expose the mice, they get um, cardiovascular pulmonary disorders. And one of the characterizes is the lung destruction. And that's not reversible. A, is the inflammation recovers, they have underlying inflammation, but not abnormal inflammation. So inflammation does not play a role after a particular exposure in terms of disease severity and aging, um, that's I personally see in my model. B is that the uh, telomere is shortened in certain cells where telomerases are unable to keep them um, at length, and after that, when the telomere is shortened, if you hit another exposure, these cells they are more prone to oxidative insult or the environmental assault, unrelated to inflammatory response. So that's two um, is a quite provoking both the aspects, but certainly we need answer in mammalian system. So we have several studies. Your comments really intrigue me because. One of the things that I was struck with the centenarians, a hundred years ago, it was quite popular to smoke. Um, there were a lot of infectious disease, and so I again come to the expert on the centenarians to ask the question, um, did they, the ones who are still living, were they smokers? Were they ones that really stuck to you know, the very healthy life? Are they ones that stick to the healthy, what do we call this, the diet your mother prescribed for you, lots of fruits and vegetables, or are they the ones that are eating meat and potatoes and saying, never, never will I eat a green thing? Maybe they are the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the idea that I got from uh, several years of study of these people is that uh, they... Uh, were in a very peculiar position. They were not usually rich, and uh, so to have the disadvantages of the nutritional disadvantages of being rich, but they, they were not poor, so they did not suffer probably of malnutrition. And um, the second thing is that they were, they had a personality uh, we did a study of the personality, and the personality is very interesting. They were, they, they are apparently not novelty seekers, uh, so they do not take a lot of risk, but uh, at the same time they have a sense of community, of what uh, is called transcendence. So it's a mixture of, uh, of a peculiar environments, uh, a peculiar uh, economic situation, and a peculiar uh, the, the genetics probably and also peculiar epigenetics because I like the fact that uh, the, envir the environmental um, effect um, may uh, leave a signature uh, at the epigenetic level and uh, I was asked by, by Giovanni Mann to look at the birth, uh, birth weight of uh, at least the offspring of centenarians to check what happened early in life. So this is very important for your uh, uh, grandchild, grandchild because uh, it is clear from some studies that what happened in utero, uh, at least in, in, in animals, uh, if you uh, induce uh, 
a lot of uh, inflammation in the two windows of the uh, gestation in mice. The, the mice produce a lot of cytokines, inflammatory cytokines. Also, the fetus has produced its own. Uh, and later on, when the, 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 the newborn appear, they are apparently healthy, but uh, when they are adult, they show, for example, behavioral changes, heavy behavioral changes of uh, regarding to similar to schizophrenia or autism. So this means that uh, for, for several years we have underestimated the early uh, nutritional or, uh, or antigenic or in, infectious uh, experience early in life which can establish uh, several um, set points, metabolic set points, immunological set points and so on. So I think that we have to look at the aging uh, since the beginning and of course uh, it matters if you uh, if your mother, what your mother um, ate, for example, there is a paper in the sure. cell showing that, uh, the father too. So, so, so showing that there is a, this effect of the paternal diet. So, uh, paternal, maternal diet, my mother did any paternal diet and so on. So, it's very complex. That's a great point. So, I think you started out at the beginning saying, quoting a Chinese proverb about don't put a black cat in a dark room and then also be, make sure the cat is there. And I think we've forgotten what you said because that was clever. And the cat may not be there. In other words, the question may not be answerable. So we use the term aging, and I have a little bit of a background in gerontology. Uh, we use the term aging as a catch-all phrase for hundreds of different changes that occur in animals and in humans and in plants over the course of time. And the answer to what causes aging is that thousands of things cause aging, and they're different in different tissues, they're different in different cell types. If you're, if you're worried about the brain when you've got a cell type that doesn't divide anymore, then telomerase doesn't have much of a, of a role to play, except in cells that might be, might be able to divide, there's very few that are left, but most of them kind of, doesn't make much difference in a muscle cell. It makes a lot of difference if you're a skin cell. Um, but telomerase doesn't necessarily play a major role in many, in many cell types. So there's huge differences in cell types and aging. And what works in one case may not work in another case, which is why we, we see this, this tremendous diversity that you're seeing, I think, in your centenarians. So I think part of our problem is our question is, 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 is way, way too focused on is there a cure for aging, basically. And no, there isn't, because there are thousands of things that are changing and they're going to be different in different populations and, and at different times in different individuals. And even the diseases, I mean some of the diseases like heart disease, some of the others are pretty important. Cancer doesn't kill that many people, it's not, it's not a major killer of old people, it's not a major age-related disease, you look at the actual numbers, it's not, you keep bringing it up, but the, the numbers do not bear you out. They, they do in terms of heart disease, they do in terms of many others, but not cancers. Cancers get younger people, not old people. Yeah, but it's supposed to be But it's not as age-related as you can comment on that. Do you agree with him? I agree perfectly. But also, uh, we have a, a lesson from the neck mold rats. Uh, I agree perfectly uh, how could not. But we have a lesson from neck mold rats where uh, we have a... a wonderful uh, example of longevity where uh, and Bertrand can uh, uh, has given a great contribution on this uh, issue. Uh, they have a high uh, a very robust system for protein stability which again involves cellular stress response on a static mechanism which can be an indication of what can a priority uh, can draw our attention if we look on some possible intervention without thinking that we can control aging, of course. My comment to that uh, uh, point is you're not necessarily right. There could be a common cause that's read out differentially in different tissues. And just because there's tissue specificity and different things happening in different tissues, which happens in all the time, does not mean there's not a common underlying mechanism of aging. 
it could just be borne out differently in different tissues. Again, that's what Tom was talking about. Aging is not the same as longevity. Here's a microphone. I, I'm not proposing that it is. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying that uh, lifespan is just one of the hundreds of phenotypes associated with aging, but it's the one most people focus, and especially people working in simple organisms that uh, are just looking at lifespan. So what they're really they're really looking at one aging phenotype. Um, so that's a uh, that's an issue that has to be considered. For sure. In terms of intervention, though, I mean, we either, we're kind of limited, right? So we need to either believe that by studying lifespan and say, yeast or, or C. elegans, that you can identify pathways that are definitely involved and that those would give you an inroad to, to targeting those pathways with the hope that it would have some effect on tissue specific aging phenotypes. The other way to do it, I guess, is to find other regimens, diet, caloric restriction, et cetera, exercise, that have a beneficial effect, determine how that's occurring, and then use that information to do interventions. I think both of those are still quite viable uh, approaches. Uh, but I totally agree that we're, we're kind of not, the aging field, in my opinion, has not really culminated on the right way to go about it and, uh, and come to a common understanding. Right. And, but, 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 sorry. There is a methodological problems. Uh, for example, I pay a lot of attention to the data which are coming out from uh, model systems in order to have some ideas to look at humans. I found that uh, many times is not the same. So people uh, privilege uh, the model systems and do not pay attention to what we have observed in humans in order to look at model systems because uh, uh, I don't want to suggest uh, um, experiment on the personality of worms, uh, but uh, something similar because uh, what what emerges from human studies uh, uh, is uh, is very interesting can can be very interesting for the um, the the model system. For example, the enormous complexity of the gut microbiota in humans would suggest that uh, many experiments in uh, mice which have been uh, uh, kept in clean environment uh, with a uh, specific type of uh, gut microbiota which is probably very different from what uh, can be in the wild uh, should be a lesson which could, should be taken into account and I think that in the, in the literature there is a privilege of uh, Ideas coming from from model system, uh, and uh, the, some of the major ideas which came from the the humans, like the mitochondrial DNA variability. In mice, there is no mitochondrial DNA variability practically because they derive only from few from few ancestors. And in humans, the mitochondrial DNA variability is enormous. So uh, this is a this is the reason why uh, mitochondrial DNA variability has been neglected in, in, in modern systems and is not so, uh, con so uh, uh, um, say, uh, taken into consideration in general. But uh, this is something that you can see very well in humans, but not in modern systems. So I think that uh, should be, uh, uh, I, I like the idea to have a, to have a suggestion from the modern system, but I like to to, 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 to ask the, the people who work in model systems to take into account what emerged from human studies. So you who work on model systems, defend yourselves. No, that was, I, I think that's a terrific point. You said knowledge and the model systems are important, but it needs to go both ways. I think that's, uh, I don't think there's anything to defend there. So I think we only have a few minutes left, and I do want you to focus now on intervening on how to extend health span. So I, I want to know how, how to stay healthy. Exercise, right? We can, just, we can improve our quality of life, actually. Our age and longevity is fixed. The God who determines, we can just improve our quality of life. <laughs> so I think a lot of them comes from... Yeah, you I think a lot of our discussion already was surrounding that. I think maybe for the last few minutes, do people from the audience have questions you want to put panels on? Tom actually applies to this category best. 
Uh, I think we're more and more flirting with committing social behavior here. Uh, even in this uh, symposium, we have people who take some of these antioxidants and others who don't. Uh, there are people who are disciplined and educated and that have embarked on a program of calorie restriction. I strongly suspect that if this were applied to a large general population, as soon as they were released from their constraints, they would rush the smorgasbord table like a basement sale at Macy's. And we are seeing uh, countries emerging into affluence, and Manfred uh, referenced the fact that uh, the 100, 100 million diabetics in China is going to triple in less than a decade. And we see throughout even fairly recent history uh, disasters uh, with uh, famines, wars, weather changes uh, brings people into uh, malnutrition and then how, how they adapt afterwards. Uh, you know, are they going to start overfeeding? You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not certain that how our ancestors, the threshold of our ancestors to what was a stress or trauma is the same today. I suspect we're far more trauma prone therefore stress susceptible today than we were thousands of years ago. Uh, uh, killing an animal, butch butchering an animal uh, was very common. The majority of Europe, the majority of America, we were farmers. Today, uh, we go to the store, buy packaged food, and I think just even watching a film of an abattoir would horrify most of us. Yet it was very common. So we're just going to be committing social behavior. And so I want to call you have a lot of uh, comments along those lines. Uh, that just to go back, for instance, the socialization of sensitivarians. I mean, how do, you, how do you put that into the calculations of what we present here? And it, it's complicated enough, and this social behavior is hopeless. So I think it's uh, not just how we intervene, to be intervene, but when we intervene. And I think it goes back to some of the comments that uh, were made uh, earlier about hidden hunger and the uh, effects of uh, poor maternal uh, nutrition and the stunting that occurs that threats uh, life. So both of those have to be considered. Yes, so I, I would like all of the uh, our wonderful panel to comment on this. My uh, grandfather lived to be 98, and uh, my grandmother lived to be 96, and they got married when they were when he was 18 and she was 16. And he used to always say that the uh, the the secret to longevity was just simply good sex. <laughs> so I would like that. I would just like to hear the thoughts on that because I'm not sure that that has really been studied very much. Maybe you can define good. I'm not. You know, honestly, it, it, isn't that important? Well, <laughs> as an Italian, you know, we have our prime minister, which is trying. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, but I, I, will, I will simply say that when I tried to do a research on the sexual life of uh, centenarians, uh, I uh, asked to prepare uh, the best questionnaire to uh, my friends uh, in the social sciences and in the neurology and, uh, and so on. And they were very good, they prepared a very good questionnaire, but when we um, gave this questionnaire to the people, it was a complete failure. Because uh, the, the centenarian women were saying, well, doctor, I don't remember, it was so many years ago. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and all around there were the daughters uh, and the, the grandchildren who were looking uh, strange, uh, strangely, that uh, her uh, grandmother could have been, uh, could have had sex. So it was a, a social control which uh, eventually the entire, uh, the entire research was a total failure. <laughs> Other comments? Um, I just want to say that as far as I know, this issue hasn't been 
studied in mice, but um, it seems obvious how to do the experiment. So I, I don't know why it's not explored. You know, we raise mice, males separate from females. So, so there you have it. Well, we now have sex in the aging field. So uh, there. I, I'd like to close the session thanking all the speakers, but also to point out that the LPI is having a conference on diet and optimal health. And so if we didn't quite get all the answers here, um, please come in September to Corvallis. We have a brand new LPI building that I'm very excited about. because I'm going to have a brand new laboratory. And hopefully it will be done enough that we can show it to you. So um, with that, any of the comments from my coaching? I'm just going to clap if we've had enough. Uh, thank the panel for your uh, terrific input. And also thank the audience for uh, interacting. And it's been a great conference. I think probably some closing comments for the conference oh, next. No, no, we have the closing comments for Regina next. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we still have more. Okay. Anyway, so, thank you, panel. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.